weapons that make your prayer and your fasting effective. And I just want to recap a little from last week. Last week I said every answer to your questions, every solution to the problems, all the blessings you wanted and the deliverances you ever needed or you've already received or will need and get in the future was prepared for you before the foundations of the world. But the Lord has a specific time to release it. And I said that this is a truth that most Christians grapple with. Because when we want something, we want it now. Especially if it's urgent to us or very important to us. But in spite of our need and how crucial it is, the Lord doesn't come until the specific time. And we see that with Lazarus when he was sick. He sent and called Jesus. When Jesus arrived, he was dead and he was buried and his body was decaying. But because Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life, and that was the time predetermined by God long before Lazarus was born for Jesus to turn up, he came at the right time. Lazarus was brought back to life and many people gave their life to Jesus Christ. I quoted Habakkuk 2, 3, which says, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it would surely come, it will not tarry. And I said in the Hebrew text, the phrase, though it tarry, literally says, though it looks like it is taken long, though it looks like it is kept behind, delayed or held back, wait for it. It is not late. It is coming at the right time. Amen? I also said whenever the devil sees faith, he begins to pay attention to a believer. Because wherever faith is, it stops the devil from moving. If you have faith, he can't destroy your health. You'll walk it out. You will trust God until you get a clean bill of health. Where there's no money, you will trust God to meet the need uh, until your pocketbook, until your account is overflowing with money again. And so wherever the devil sees faith, he makes a plan, and that plan is to replace faith with doubt, with discouragement, with depression, with worrying, with wavering, with unbelief and fear. So as long as you have faith, it will cause the devil to attack you because you are now a serious threat to what he wants to do in the earth. I said whenever you find faith in a believer, you will find a Jericho wall. You will find an impossible situation. You will see a Red Sea, a wilderness, or a rock of Gibraltar because wherever there is faith, there is always a trial. There is always an impossible situation. Wherever there is faith, you will hear the word, it can't be done. You will hear impossible. You will get a rejection letter. But once there is faith in your life, faith believes God to do whatever man says it cannot be done. I said the devil challenges faith because it stops him from succeeding. Real faith cannot be put out. It cannot be extinguished. It's the fire living in your spirit. Even when circumstances, external circumstances, want to convince you to give up, faith will say, I believe God. Faith will say, I will not move from my position in trusting God to do what he said he would do. Real faith is steadfast and unmovable. Real faith cannot be intimidated. Are you hearing me today? When you have faith, you cannot be intimidated. When they call you in and they begin to threaten you and they say to you, if you don't agree to this, if you don't sign this letter, if you don't come on board with the mischievousness that we want to do, we are going to have to demote you and eventually release you. Real faith cannot be intimidated because faith knows that God is your employer. Faith knows that the hope of the hypocrite shall perish. 
Faith believes a scripture that says, who is he or she that can purpose something evil against you and cause it to happen to you if God does not approve it? So where there's faith, there can't be any intimidation. And so today I want to move on the second weapon. The text in Mark eleven twenty four 24 says, Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And so the text demands that every believer approach the Lord in faith when he petitions him. The second weapon that makes our prayer and fasting awesome and undefeatable is the word of God. The word of God precedes faith. You don't get faith on its own. Even though God has given to every man a measure of faith. Romans 10, 17 tells us faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And so if you are going to stand in faith that is strong and faith that is obstinate, faith that is stubborn, faith that would not move, faith that would say, oh, king, we respect you, but we will not bow down. There must be word of God inside of you because the Bible clearly states that whenever you read the word of God, whenever you believe the word of God, whenever you hide the word of God in your heart, that faith comes as a result of the word. So when you hear believers talking about having mega faith, but they don't know the word, it tells you what kind of faith they're supposed to have. Every prayer must first be the will of God. 1 John 5, 14 to 15 says, This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, Whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. So every prayer must be the will of God. Before you get into, oh, God will give me the desires of my heart. Every prayer must first be the will of God, which means that if you are praying the desires of your heart, then that desire must be the will of God as well. So every prayer must be the will of God because James tells us the reason why some prayers are not answered is because we are asking for things for the wrong reason. We want to walk in pride. We want to show off. We are asking for things that is not the will of God or things that God God wants to give us, but we have a wrong attitude towards it. Every prayer must be accompanied by the scripture or scripture that backs it up, that supports it, that approves and releases what you are requesting or asking the Lord to do for you or to give for, to you. Jesus says in John 14, 13 to 14, Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. So when you start to ask God for things, you must have the receipts. You know, when you're returning something, you have to have the receipt. And all the tags and the barcodes and everything must be on it. Well, you just don't ask God for things because you can ask God for things. Uh, you must have the scripture that supports uh, what you want. One of the graces every believer prays for to the Lord is for mercy. Every believer prays and asks God for mercy whenever they sin. Mercy is God doing for you what you don't deserve. You have just done wrong, and you are throwing yourself on the mercy of the court, and you are saying to God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Both testaments have scriptures pertaining to believers requesting mercy from God 
when they sinned and about God being merciful to them after they sinned. In Psalm 51 verse 1, David says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. And so, throughout your lifetime, you will find yourself seeking God for mercy. You see, when we sin, when we yield to temptation, when the devil gets us to sin, after we've sinned, then he jumps in there and he says, God ain't going to forgive you. Oh my God, that's a big one. You know how many times you've done that? You think he's going to forgive you? Although the Bible says a righteous man may fall as many as seven times. Uh, and in the seventh time, God will pick him up. Even though Jesus tells us that we shall forgive 70 times seven, which means infinity. Every time somebody do you wrong, you are to forgive. And so God does the same. And so when the devil comes in and says, you don't deserve it. God is going to judge you and he's going to kill you. You know that the scripture says uh, that if you ask for mercy, that God will show mercy. Uh, in Habakkuk 3, 2, uh, the prophet declares in wrath, remember mercy. Oh God, I know I deserve a good weapon, but remember mercy in your anger. In Luke 18 verse 13, it tells us the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I don't know about you, but I can listen all my fingers and toes. The times that I was so grateful for the mercy of God. Deuteronomy 4.31 says, For the Lord God is a merciful God. He will not forsake you nor destroy you. Hebrews 14.16 says, Let us come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Lamentations 3, 22 to 23 says, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. When we miss the mark, God becomes so compassionate and he decides, if I really do to my daughter or my son what they deserve, they're not going to make it. And so he shows mercy. God's mercy is also his loving kindness, his goodness and his favor that he gives to us throughout our everyday life. Psalm 23 verse 6 says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. In other words, the Lord has promised every believer pleasure and joy, happiness and provision, Healing and protection, deliverance and victory over every enemy. So God's mercy is also his goodness. He's merciful in seeing to it that you have everything that you need. Moses said to the Jews in Exodus 34, 6, he says, The Lord God is merciful and gracious and abundant in goodness and truth. The psalmist says in Psalm 117 verse 2, His merciful kindness is towards us, and the truth of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. David says in Psalm 31, 19, How great is thy goodness, which thou hast laid up for them that fear thee, which thou hast wrought for them that trust in thee before the sons of men. So we see that God is merciful, and not dealing with us according to our iniquities. And we also see that the mercy of God is also his loving kindness. His graciousness to us. His tender mercies, his compassion, and his understanding. Another thing each believer needs on a daily basis is guidance and counsel. Every believer must know that the Lord is the only counselor of the church, not the devil. Isaiah 9, 6 declares, For unto us a son is given, and his name shall be called Counselor. And so when it comes to counsel, 
The Lord is the only one that should be speaking into your ears and speaking into your spirit. The devil has no legal right to counsel a believer because he's not your father and he's not your God. The scriptures confirm that the Lord does and will continue to guide and counsel us in all our decisions, uncertainties, and perplexities. It's unfortunate, but there are many who serve God who believes that he doesn't communicate with man anymore. And so they just flip through the scriptures to see what they can find to help them to make a decision. Many believers are abandoning God as a wonderful counselor and they're finding themselves sitting down on the couches of therapists hoping that they will get an answer from some highly credentialed degree degree person to tell them what to do but the Lord is the counselor of the church he's still anointing pastors and leaders in the house of God with wisdom and knowledge and quick understanding to give you a word of knowledge and a word of wisdom because the things that God knows about right now and the future which is the next five minutes from now and days ahead and months ahead there's no therapist 1800 or the app that you can use can help you only God can put you on the right track in Psalm 32 verse 8 the Lord declares I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way that thou shalt go I will guide thee with mine eye we can't be like King Ahaziah who sent to Baal to find out if he was going to be healed and the Lord sent the prophet to him saying is it because there's no God in Israel that you will go to the devil to find out if you are going to be made whole. And the Lord said you shall die on the bed. I want you to know that God gets very angry when his children neglect him and forsake him. And we seek out the counsel of men. Before you get to the pastor, you need to pray first. Before you get to the church mother, you need to begin to inquire of God and then he will tell you who to go to if he doesn't want to minister to you directly by his spirit. And so we've got to get back into seeking God for guidance. In the Catholic church, they go to the box and they go to the father. In the hope that he will give them an answer. And he's limited in whatever he can say or do. David says in Psalm 16 verse 7. I will praise thee who counsels me. The psalmist Asaph said in Psalm 73 24. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel. If God isn't directing your path. Don't expect to be successful or to gain much success. If you think you can do it or your parents have the answer, if you neglect the all-wise God, his name is Eldia, the God of all knowledge. His name is Sophia, the God of wisdom. And if you forsake God, then you're forsaking your help and your future. That's why we've been given the Holy Ghost. Jesus says in John 16, 13, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, into all light, and into all wisdom. And so one of the weapons we need when we go into our prayer and fasting, you must have the word of God that backs up what you need. When you begin to pray to God for help, Lord, you need money to take care of the necessities of life. You must know the scriptures. You must give God his word because he's watching over his word to perform it. He says that his word will not return unto him void. You need to go to Psalm 68 verse 6 that says he brings out those who are bound into prosperity. Sometimes you feel bound up in a season, like if a curse is upon your life, or if you're in a, in a season of famine, but he says that he brings out the bound into prosperity. 
in Deuteronomy 8, 18, he declares, you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he that gives you power to get love. It is God. If he doesn't help you, it doesn't happen. When you need food, Solomon says in Proverbs 10, 3, the Lord does not let the righteous go hungry. Could you imagine a need and you're going to your praying and fasting and you begin to give God his word. Lord, you said in Psalm 22, 26, the poor will eat and be satisfied. Lord, you said in Philippians 4, 19, that you will supply all my need. Lord, you said in Psalm 23, verses 1 to 3, that because you are my shepherd, I will lack nothing. And you're giving God his word. When you need some way to live, you give him Isaiah 32, 18. My people will abide uh, in a peaceful habitation, in secure dwellings, uh, and in quiet resting places. You give him 2 Samuel 7, 27, where God declares, uh, I will build you a house. Whatever you need, you must have the scriptures that supports it. Because you're giving God his word, he said in Isaiah, to put me in remembrance. And every time you quote scripture, you're saying to God, you've made a covenant with me. You've made an ironclad agreement. You've made a promise that you will never break. And so I am standing on your word. Because of your word, faith comes out of the word. Because of your word, my faith is in you. In your ability to do exactly what what you say you're going to give me money you're going to give me food and you're going to give me somewhere to live when it comes to protection and deliverance everywhere we turn there's an enemy somewhere lurking in the darkness you give God the word you name your enemy you say Lord you said in Deuteronomy 28 verse 7 that you will cause my enemies that rise up against me to be smitten before my, your face that they will come out against me one way and they will flee in seven different directions. Lord, you said it. You said that you will smite my enemies. They're coming one way on the number four train to my Manhattan. But you say right before your face, you are going to smite them and they're going to run and get on on any bus or train or ferry because you promised me protection and deliverance. In Exodus chapter 14, verse 14, it says the Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. The Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace uh, in spite of the lies and the slander and the rumor and the things that people are saying. You just hold your peace for the Bible says to hold your peace uh, is all together your wisdom. And let God fight for you. That's something I've learned early in the battle. Especially when you're a member of the congregation and the rumor is spreading like the bubonic plague. You just hold your peace. And you let people talk. And you just live your authentic Christian life. You pay your tithes and give offering. You worship God in the beauty of holiness. And let people talk. Because as they're talking and you are worshiping, God is fighting for you. And when God exposes that mess, the faces of people are made ashamed. David says in Psalm 34, 17 to 18, the righteous cry and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and save such as be of a contrite spirit. The righteous cry, the Lord hears and delivers them out of the troubles. The cry there can be used literally and figuratively because sometimes in our prayer we're just crying to God, but we have a, an assurance that he hears and he delivers. In Psalm 18, verse 2 to 3, the psalmist says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress. 
and my deliverer, my God, and my strength, uh, in whom I will trust, my buckler, and the horn of my salvation, and my high tower, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from mine enemies. Whenever you pray, whatever you are praying for, you must have the scriptures that back it up. Because it is not scripture to God. It is his word. It is his promise that he has made to you. When you're praying about your children and your marriage and your finances and your circumstances, when you're afraid of the enemy, when the enemy seemingly has come in like a flood, the Lord says through the prophet Isaiah, in chapter 41, verses 10 to 13, God says to those of you that are fearful, whatever fear you are experiencing, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. Yes, I will uphold you with my right hand of righteousness. Behold, all they that are incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. They shall be as nothing, and they that strive with thee shall perish. Thou shalt seek them and shall not find them, even them that contended with thee. They that war against thee shall be as nothing and as a thing of naught. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help you. So God is saying, the army, the enemies, whatever is standing before you, it shall become non-existent. What you are seeing today, Paul says, the things in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says, whatever you are seeing is temporary. Whatever you are experiencing now is not going to last forever. But what you don't see in this physical realm uh, that you are believing God for, he says, that is what will last. And so I want to encourage you today to read uh, the word of God. Read the word of God. Memorize the scriptures. Because if your prayers are going to be effective, you must have the word of God. It's one thing to poke your soul and to tell God how you hurt and how sad you feel and how disappointed you are about what was done to you. But after you've poured out the bitterness of your soul like Hannah did, then you must have receipts. Then you must remind God, you promise that you will give me beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. You've got to be able to remind God that you promise you will never leave me and you will never forsake me. When your knees feel weak and wobbly and it looks like you are going to fall under the weight that is upon you, you should be able to remind God that he said, uh, underneath are his everlasting arms. When it looks like everyone is against you, you must be able to remind God that he said that he will encamp round about you with songs of deliverances. That as the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. When it looks like everything seemed to be impeaching the word of God, you must be able to tell him, I believe the report of the Lord. I believe, God, that it will be for me just like you said it would be. I believe that your word is of a kind uh, that will be fulfilled at the appointed and proper time. And as you are giving God the receipts, as you are giving God the word, as you speak the word, that's how your faith increases. Because whenever your spirit hears the word uh, and it grabs hold of that word, uh, your faith increases. Uh, and then you find yourself saying, Lord, I believe in you. Lord, I trust you. Lord, my expectation is still in you. It doesn't matter how long I may have to wait. 
or how dark my night may become, uh, I believe you, God. Uh, and I stand upon your word uh, because you are not man that you shall lie. Uh, neither are you the son of man uh, that you shall change your mind. Uh, even when you are sick and you can't get up off the bed, uh, you stare right there and bless God and say, God, I can't move now, uh, but I'm going to be moving anytime soon. Uh, when it looks like you're not going to be able to meet that deadline, you say to God, I call upon you for help. And you said you would. I believe you, God. Stand with me, please, in the presence of the living God. For those of you that can remain, I want you to get one scripture. One scripture. That you're going to give to God today pertaining to what you are believing him for. Everything we ask for, it must be accompanied by the word of God. Because his word is his promise to you, it's his covenant. For those of you who are going, go with your scripture knowing that God is watching over his word to perform it. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Have you gotten your scripture? Is your scripture ready? Are you ready to put your faith in God? Father, today in the name of Jesus Christ, we come before your throne of grace. Each of us standing here and those who have left and those who wanted to come today but they just couldn't make it. Each of us have a need a test, a trial, something we are going through. There's something today, God, that we need you to perfect, that we need you to make whole. There's an enemy that we want to see no more forever, a circumstance, whatever you want to call it, a complication, a situation, whatever it is. We come to you today, God. And each of us bring that scripture each of us bring that scripture, which is your word that you have given to us. Your word that is forever settled in heaven, that will never return unto you void, that you are watching over to perform. And mighty God, we speak that word out of our mouths. We speak it out. We speak it out of our mouths and we speak it over our circumstances. We speak it, God, in faith. And we believe, God, that when we pray that you will answer. Because faith and your word goes together. And so, Father, I thank you now for the miracles that are going to transpire. For you are a way maker. Hallelujah. You are a miracle worker. You are a promise keeper. You are the light in the darkness. And so every mother and every wife, every child of God, every father, hallelujah, that is standing here, every fiance, every boyfriend, every girlfriend, father, every household um, representative, father, I bring it all to you now. Even tax season and all the people go through I thank you now, God, in the name of Jesus, uh, that as your sons and daughters have spoken your word, uh, that you are already working on it. Uh, you are already working on it. Uh, you are already working on it. Hallelujah. You are already working on it. Uh, you have given uh, a solemn promise uh, and a guarantee uh, of success and prosperity. Jesus said to Martha, he said, did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? Father, we believe your word. We believe in your promises. And we want to thank you today, Holy Father, for all that you are doing behind the scene that we are not even aware of to make certain that all is well. Bless your sons and daughters. 
as we continue day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade, to continue to trust you. Strengthen us, almighty God. Undergird us and cause us, mighty God, to have a firm persuasion in your ability to bless, to protect, to provide, to heal, to deliver, and to make our way clear. I thank you now, God. Every prayer request in this basket, I lift it up to you. And I thank you, God, that all is well. All is well. Because we ask for it in faith in the name of Jesus. In your word that declares you will not withhold anything good from them that walk uprightly. I thank you for the offering. I thank you, God. It's increasing. It's becoming more. It's becoming better, God. You are a provider. Hallelujah. I thank you, Jesus, for all that you have done for us here today as we have received and embraced your word. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the throne of his grace with exceeding joy, the only wise God in whom there is all dominion, majesty and power, both now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you. Continue to hold on to the word of God. The word of men will fail and it changes. What they say today, they don't mean tomorrow. But the word of God stands forever. Trust God and it will be for you just like the Lord said it would be. Thank you.